So our first question I would like to call on His Highness the Emir of Kano, whom I have not seen yet. Oh! <laughs> Many of us also know you as the former <laughs> governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Your Highness. Thank you very much, Your Majesty. Let me join um, colleagues in congratulating you on this 10th anniversary as a, a special advocate. Um, I know we go back a long way. Remember when you were first appointed, 2009, that was the year I became Governor of Central Bank. And uh, I think I was your first meeting at the World Bank, and you were my first meeting. So uh, it's... Um, and I've been following your progress over the last 10 years, and I congratulate you um, on what you've achieved. Uh, my question is linked to a disagreement we had when I was governor of Central Bank. <laughs> <laughs> After you launched our financial inclusion program and we, uh, our strategy, and we started mobile banking. And we had a number of robust discussions where you've been more technologically savvy than I, and trusting technology more than I did, uh, wanted us to go fast with the telcos, and I wanted a bank-led model. Uh, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that you were right and I was wrong. Uh, and two years later, I had a chance to acknowledge to you when you came back to Nigeria that I was wrong and you were right, and I'm happy the central bank is correcting my mistake. Um, but at the heart of my concern, um, coming from risk management background and after financial crisis, was that we all agree that technology comes with threats and opportunities. And my concern was how to protect customers uh, as we move into a highly, um, um, in, into modern technological environment. So can you expand on in what way your work would help protect customers as we drive technology and financial inclusion? Your Highness, first of all, thank you very much for coming here. You've been a great proponent of financial inclusion, even though from a bank-led model initially. Um, but you're very right. I think, uh, like I just said in my, in my speech, you know, I, technology is really our best chance to really make financial inclusion happen. So we'll have to embrace it, but embrace it with also not only the opportunities, but also with the risks. And um, the way we've been trying to actually um, address this issue is, first of all, get together the innovators with the regulators. Because by having the dialogue between both, you can actually have a better understanding what are the real risks that are actually uh, being underlined in this new fintech uh, uh, type of financial service providers. Um, it is about sometimes uh, uh, capital risks, it is sometimes about operational risks, but they have to be understood. And we don't speak with each other, probably that's not really going to happen. So that was my first thing that I try to do, is actually to, to get regulators and innovators to discuss together. The other issue is for regulators to learn among each other. We're going to be uh, going to um, uh, Singapore in November to the FinTech Festival, and a lot of regulators are going to get together there and going to be discussing with each other, how did you solve this issue? How did you try to address this other issue? I think that you know, learning from each other is extremely powerful. We also produced a report for a lot of the emerging markets for them to cut corners in the learning curve of actually how to deal with these new entrants to the market, um, which have actually been very, very valuable to a lot of people. The other issue, which um, I think is extremely important, I always like to call it public goods, and we're always discussing about what the name should be like, which sometimes go beyond financial inclusion. And um, these are very important issues. Data privacy has been mentioned. It's not something that is only for financial services. I mean, data privacy is a very big issue, but it's something that needs to be addressed. Cybersecurity goes beyond financial inclusion, but is essential for financial inclusion to happen in a sustainable way. IDs, identification, very, very important to have something that is also uh, public-based and in which you can actually have the KYC uh, done. Connectivity, we talk about women financial inclusion, well, we have to also talk about the digital inclusion for a lot, certainly the poorest, certainly the women, certainly the farmers. Interoperability. Without interoperability, we're not going to have an open system that is efficient and that is really uh, solid enough to actually take these amount of uh, payment uh, uh, transactions that are actually happening in many of these economies. The financial and digital literacy, 
fair competition. We just talked, you know, maybe just one winner takes it all and takes a whole market, and that is also never good for consumers. And physical infrastructure, such as agent networks for people to cash in, cash out, with their own risk in itself, but those are manageable. So I think we've actually had a long learning curve. We have fantastic examples of many countries have been doing this in a very good way. Um, and I think we have to keep on learning each other because innovation hasn't stopped. We're going to keep on having new innovations and we'll have to keep on updating each other and analyzing what needs to be done. But I really welcome uh, the amount of uh, you know, engagement that I see from all the regulatory perspective and the Basel Committee, which actually have been now delving into this new subject and actually providing guidance to a lot of regulators around the world. Thank you, Your Highness. For the next question, I would like to call on Mary Ellen Eskandarian, who is here. <coughs> Mary Ellen, your question. Thank you, Tillman. Your Majesty, congratulations and thank you so much for all of your work. You and, and Melinda both spoke so eloquently about women's financial inclusion and you've always been such a great champion um, of making sure that women have, as you say, both digital and financial inclusion. I wonder though, are there any other segments that you think we should be turning our attention to and, and require that, that urgent need in addition to, to women in terms of financial inclusion? Yes, um, first of all, um, even though there are you know, farmers and micro and small and medium-sized enterprises need a lot of attention, I still would like to insist on the women because when I started doing this work, I thought, you know, it's going to go by itself when you change the regulations. Everybody's going to be taking it up. And um, it didn't happen. The amount of women that actually had access and usage of financial services did grow, but we have a consistent gap between men and women. And um, it's, uh, there's a misconception that uh, financial services are gender neutral, that, you know, that women and men demand the same type of financial services. And that is not really so. So I think we need to do an ulterior effort to really uh, do a lot more work to see what are the needs of women and what are the, uh, you know, in different cultures, because definitely that changes from the US to the Philippines to, African, to the African continent. So I, I wouldn't like to generalize, but we still have this 9% gender gap. And um, if we're now looking into the future, we're gonna be depending on technology. And on an average today, uh, women are 10% less likely to, use a, to have a mobile phone. They are 26% less likely to use internet. So if we're gonna be depending on this digitization, digital inclusion will be an extremely important issue that we need to um, look into for them to be really fully digitally, uh, financially included. So we need to advocate um, to change some of these barriers. Sometimes are cultural norms, sometimes you know, the husband doesn't let their wives to get out of the house. My husband does, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's a cons just a constraint because she's a you know, caretaker of the whole house and she cannot move very freely. Sometimes they have less IDs, 33% of women have less IDs than men. So there's just so many different issues that we need to really address per jurisdiction, per country, and really uh, try to um, uh, speak with every country and try to change that. So it's digital inclusion, financial inclusion, and for all of that, one thing that is amazing is when I started doing this work, not only there was not a lot of data, and we got that data in, but there's not a lot of gender disaggregated data. So even in my country, the Netherlands, where we're talking about with the banking industry and how many loans they give to SMEs, mostly the CEOs didn't really know and when they realized it was you know, around 30%, sometimes less, they were shocked. And now they're really doing something about it. So, you know, data gives people knowledge and they, they make these issues actionable. And I think we need to invest a lot more in data, both on the public side, but also on the private sector side. Uh, mostly the telecom companies do not know how many of the clients are women. Um, only one-fifth of them, and that is shocking because we're going to be depending on actually giving good services to them. How do you actually define a good service for a woman if you don't know that your client there is a woman or not? So, um, again, uh, a huge uh, work to be undertaken, but with a huge potential. We know what it's like to invest in women. That means you invest in the whole family and the whole community, and we know what it would be like to GDP growth if we would actually have at par 
the labor participation of women to men. Thank you. Good. For the next question, I would like to call on Alain Job, the CEO of Unilever. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and thank you very much, Your Majesty, for your leadership and congratulations on everything that uh, you've achieved. Um, you crack the whip on your CEO group every year at Davos. Um, and uh, Ajay, we've been working together uh, thanks to uh, being beaten up in Davos. And I thought uh, we might, tr might as well try and get ahead of the curve and ask, what more do you think the private sector can do, uh, <laughs> particularly at the bottom of the pyramid? Uh, um, and are there any limitations, things you think the private sector should stay away from so we can get working on our homework before we see you again on this subject? <laughs> Thank you very much. I think my, uh, um, my image is getting a little bit worse and worse by everybody that has been speaking. Um, let me say, first of all, um, the private sector is essential. I mean, the governments are the ones responsible for the public goods, for the rules and regulations, um, but the private sector is the one that's going to provide scale. And I'm really happy about these innovative partnerships that we've been seeing that Ajay has been uh, doing with you, but you know, you're not the only ones in a CEO partnership. We've actually seen a, a flourishment of these partnerships of actually a company that needs potatoes and uh, to buy potatoes, but they cannot source it locally. And by getting together with a telecom operator that would actually do the payments and with a bank and insurance companies, all of a sudden these women farmers have access to markets because they will buy the potatoes. They will actually have access to payments immediately, access to inputs, and also access to credit. And on top of that, health insurance through so this insurance company. None of these companies would have been able to go so far in into these sort of rural areas. So my issue, and I keep on insisting in the CEO partnership, is it's, I know that um, I. I have the whip, or I don't know how you call it. Uh, I, I don't want to repeat what you said. <laughs> but um, I think that one thing is to have all the CEOs, the global CEOs, sitting around the table. But we have to get the local CEOs really convinced on this issue, and lawyers convinced on this issue, because this is innovation is going really beyond what you normally do. If we really are serious about this issue, we need to innovate, and we have to have courage to go beyond business as usual. And that is hard, it's hard to explain to your shareholders, it's hard to explain to your local CEOs, and it's hard to explain sometimes through the regulators that are like, you know, well, you're supposed to be a bank not to be doing all these other things. So I really hope that we can keep on uh, working together. There's a lot of markets that we uh, have to still service, so I'm really counting on you. Uh, so um, thank you very much for your collaboration. We, we want to bring this to a KLM precision landing. Uh, on time, be respectful of your time. So we only have uh, time for one more question from Mayada El Zogbi at CFR CFI. And it is on the SDGs, which also allows you to bring this back together at the UN, Your Majesty, for any last concluding remarks you want to make. Mayada. Thank you so much, Tillman. Uh, Your Majesty, congratulations on an amazing 10 years. Um, and thank you for including us and thank you for including us in your celebration, and thank you uh, for picking my question. Um, so my question to you is about the SDGs, and as you know, the financial inclusion is not a standalone SDG, but we've been saying that it's an important enabler uh, of the other SDGs, and it has potential to have a big impact on the SDGs. So I want to talk about the measurement of financial inclusion progress. Um, how is that done? Um, within the SDGs, and what does financial inclusion, con how does it contribute to achieving the SDGs by 2030, given that we have 11 more years to go? Thank you so much. Um, of course, the relation, I mean, my title is financial inclusion for development, so uh, it seems self-explanatory, but sometimes we really have to make the point, you know, where do we really touch and help uh, uh, the, the outcomes of the sustainable development goals? Like I've always said, financial inclusion is not an end in itself, but rather a means to an end. And um, one of the things we've actually achieved is actually make the relationship to a lot of these very big outcomes. Um, so yes, uh, we are within seven SDGs, 
for example, reduction of poverty, food security, uh, women economic empowerment, etc. And we are under eight targets. So we make at all the indicators and feed into the results we have to present in a couple of years uh, as accomplishment of the sustainable development goals. So. Um, how do we measure this? And, and it goes back to what I was just saying. We need to have indicators. We need to measure progress. Not only to sort of show that we've actually made progress, because we need to also see what are the things that we really need to change. Like they said today, it's not only about people having access, it's also people are changing their life because they actually had access to the financial service that actually improved their you know, cash flow and the, fun and the financial uh, uh, um, you know, situation in general. I'm extremely happy and I have to be very thankful to the World Bank and the Gates Foundation that uh, some years ago uh, we started this uh, survey book which is actually called Findex. And um, there we have 140 countries, and uh, measurements are done every three years. And you can see, you know, first of all, you can make a comparable between countries. And you can see very clearly where, where the, the advances are going, where the progress, where the stalling is actually happening, and where do we really have to focus more and more attention. The IMF, the IMF has done a fantastic job with the Financial Access Survey, and uh, which actually even includes now gender uh, uh, data. So we ask the central banks around the world, you know, how many accounts are there? Do you know? Do you see the growth? And how many women-owned accounts? And I have to say that even Christine Lagarde uh, was personally involved with me to push central bankers to give that gender disaggregated data. And when they got this gender disaggregated data, a lot of them was like, oh my God, I didn't realize that actually we were not serving women properly. We also had the World Bank Enterprise Surveys and the Remittance Surveys, and all this data is basically feeding into this eight, uh, um, into the seven goals, and we're gonna be presenting that. So. Um, I have to say that um, one big uh, um, analysis the World Bank did some years ago that really convinced me to get into this issue is there was a longitudinal empirical study that actually said financial inclusion is not only pro-growth, but is also pro-poor, therefore reducing inequality. And we see, I mean, tons of evidence. In Nepal, we have examples that women-headed households have increased their spending on education once they had access to savings accounts. In Tanzania, thanks to digitization of payments, uh, people have been a seen a reduction in water collection from three hours into 10 minutes. This is women, you know, lining up to get water. And go globally, pay-as-you-go companies provided 10 million people with affordable modern energy thanks to digital financial options. So I think we need to do more to actually even have more effect in maybe a lot more sustainable development goals. And like I said, you know, you have to measure it, uh, you have to follow it up, and that will give us more inspiration to work on the future. Thank you so much. <coughs> with that, with that, and a big thank you to all the distinguished speakers and for all of you for coming. We are concluding the proceedings. Thank you very much again, Your Majesty. Thank you very much for coming.